Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought uh, and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the dead. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, and of the seal, for the devil is come, and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. May God bless to us the reading of his own word. Our theme then is what God's word teaches about the devil. What God's word teaches about the devil. The Bible glorifies God, its ultimate author, not the devil. But it does also tell us what we need to know about the devil so that we may glorify God by not being ignorant of his devices and by using the whole armor of God to quench his fiery darts. Some things uh, that we will have to say tonight that we will be familiar with but perhaps other things not so much. First of all, the origin of the devil. The origin of the devil. Where does the devil come from and how is he so wicked? Well, first of all, 
creation, the creation of the devil. God created the angels as a company. We have in Hebrews 12.22 that reference to an innumerable company of angels. The angels are not a race. Man was created uh, as a race with, the, with a federal representative, that is Adam. Whereas the angels were all created individually and not by way of procreation. That when you think about it is obvious and yet it's something that uh, can easily be overlooked and not really thought about. <coughs> so the angels were not created with exactly the same power. There are cherubim and seraphim. There are principalities and powers and thrones and dominions referred to in scripture. So all of the angels were created individually and Satan was created by God and created holy. The holy angels worship God, they rejoice in all his works, they fulfill his will, they minister to the people of God as those who shall be the heirs of salvation. They were sometimes used as agents of God's revelation, for example, at Christ's birth, or in connection with the book of Revelation, an angel spoke with John and so forth. There is no evidence that the holy angels are given direct, direct access to the souls of men. So that's the angels generally. But then, secondly, under this heading of the origin of the devil, the fallen angels. The angels that did not fall are called elect angels. 1 Timothy 5, verse 28. The apostle refers to the elect angels. That is, God had chosen them, uh, unlike man, not chosen to be redeemed from sin, but chosen to be kept from sin, so that they did not fall into sin. The angels not so elected, in some manner through the withholding or removal of God's sustaining power, and we don't fully understand this, they were not kept, and so they kept not their first estate. In Jude, the letter of Jude and verse 6, we have a reference, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And in Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, for it's God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. And so God had decreed from eternity that some angels would be kept sinless and some would not. I'm well aware that that doesn't answer all the questions at all about the origin of sin, except to say that even a sinless creature is dependent upon the power of God to remain sinless. And as there were different ranks among the holy angels, both before and after the apostasy of, the, of Satan and uh, those who fell with him, so also among those apostate angels, those angels that fell from their first estate, there is, a very, there is diversity of power and therefore of control uh, over one another. And Satan is evidently the chief of the fallen angels. Pride is the essence of all sin 
And because sin is the rejection of the authority of God and the denial of God's right of government over us, then pride is a denial of our place as creatures dependent upon our Creator and a denial of our place as dependent creatures who are obliged and ought to submit to an almighty Creator. So Satan's first sin was a lifting up with pride. So 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 6, speaking about the elders of the church, is not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil, that is, into the same condemnation as the devil fell into. So that uh, the fall of the devil, of Satan, was evidently, uh, in essence, uh, a dissatisfaction with the supremacy of God and evidently a section of the angels fell with him. And so he is constantly spoken of as the head of the fallen angels or demons. So the uh, lost at the judgment, those who are condemned, are condemned to that fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25 and verse 41 or in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 we read there of wherein in time past he walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. He is called the prince of the power of the air. The one who above all governs the fallen, uh, the, the world of darkness and of fallen angels or demons. So that's the origin of the devil. Secondly, the names of the devil. The names of the devil. Satan is constantly used and means adversary. He is the adversary first and foremost of God himself. He is the adversary of God. He hates God. He hates the supremacy of God. And then, because man is the crown of God's creation, he attacked Adam and sought and did uh, lead him away from his uh, original innocence. And after the fall, he then uh, gives expression to his enmity to God by uh, his enmity to the people of God and also to God <coughs> incarnate, the seed, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We'll come to that more in a moment. He is also called Apollyon, or the Destroyer. This name is found in Revelation chapter 9 and uh, verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon, the Destroyer, or the Destroyer. He seeks to destroy all that glorifies God. The devil seeks to destroy all that glorifies God. He is also called Diab Diabolos or the accuser in Revelation 12 verse 10 that we read just now. Uh, it reads, And I heard a loud voicing in heaven, now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And the Greek word for accuser is 
diabolos, from which we have diabolical and so on in our English language. He hates the kingdom of grace. Why that is so, we've come to in a little while. But he hates the kingdom of grace, the saving power of God, and accuses God's people. So, for example, Job, uh, the insinuation is made, doth God, doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, there's nothing real to it. And uh, he detests and opposes faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. These are some of the names. Some would add to this the name Lucifer, which is found in Isaiah 14 and verse 12. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? But when we look at, looked at that verse as we proceeded through the, uh, Isaiah in our evening services, we saw that it doesn't refer to Satan, that the Lucifer uh, or the morning star is in fact the king of Babylon. But the reason that the name Lucifer is uh, by many assumed to refer to the devil is because some of the uh, early writers after the apostolic age linked up this verse with Luke 10 and verse 18. Luke 10 and verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now that verse uh, in that verse, Christ is referring to Satan being cast out of heaven to work havoc on earth until Christ's kingship puts, puts him under his feet and, give, and triumphs over him and gives the victory also to all his saints. Whereas Isaiah 14 verse 12 refers to the day star, the Lucifer, it, it's referring to the downfall of an earthly uh, proud ruler and that's the king of Babylon. You see in verse 11, thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. And if you go back to verse 4, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, how hath the oppressor ceased uh, and the golden city ceased. So it does not seem legitimate to apply the name Lucifer uh, to Satan or the devil. Unless possibly some I think it may even see the king of Babylon as a type and picture. It's difficult to get that from the text itself. Thirdly, the present position of the devil. The present position of the devil. Satan is called the prince of this world. The prince of this world in John 12 verse 31 and in other places. He's also called the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. Now he's not called the prince of the world, but of this world. The Lord Jesus reigns over all. The Lord is governing everything according to his own good pleasure. But Satan is the prince of this world in the sense that he has a usurped control over fallen men and women. And in no sense does Satan have any legitimate authority of any kind. He certainly wickedly spoke as if he did when he uh, uh, tempted the Lord Jesus in the wilderness, but that's because he is a liar. He has no uh, legitimate authority over anyone. And uh, that's why the <coughs> ransom to save an idea of the death of Christ must be wholly rejected. God does not do any deals with Satan, 
And the death of Christ was not a ransom to Satan, but a ransom to, all, to the justice of God himself. But Christ's redeeming work shows Satan to be a defeated enemy. He is cast out, John 12, 31. Now is the prince of this world cast out. He is the strong man who is said to be bound in Matthew 12, 29. Christ's work of redemption on the cross is uh, a triumph over Satan and is described as that in the scriptures. Colossians 2 and verse 15. Colossians 2 and verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Christ's work is of redemption, is a defeating and a triumphing over Satan and the powers of darkness. It is in fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 after the fall when uh, the Lord said to the serpent that the seed of the woman would bruise his head and he would bruise her heel. That is, that the seed of the woman would suffer the bruising of the heel, but he would triumph. He would bruise or crush the head of the serpent. Now why is Christ's redeeming work a triumph over the devil? Firstly, because Satan's wicked hatred of Christ is made to serve God's purpose of redemption. Satan's wicked hatred of Christ was made to serve God's purpose of redemption. Satan, we are told, entered into Judas. We've often remarked on the contradiction between the fact that, Christ, that Satan, in the temptation in the wilderness, sought to deflect Christ from the cross. And yet, Satan entered into Judas to bring about the betrayal and death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And sometimes people struggle with that, but we shouldn't struggle with it. Sin is irrational and contradictory. It lurches because it is uh, the ultimate irrationality of fighting against the Almighty. We should not expect consistency and rationality even in an exceedingly intelligent but exceedingly wicked being like Satan. And uh, sin is such that we, that, that, that in the, the, those in the bondage of sin and the depraved, those with a depraved nature cannot cease from sin even when it brings ruin upon them. And so on the one hand, Satan is afraid of the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15, the promise of the triumphant seed of the woman, Christ, and seeks the uh, diversion of that, seeks to have Christ destroyed by Herod when he is born and seeks to deflect him from the cross in the wilderness. But on the other hand, his great enmity to Christ is such that he still enters into, into Judas and seeks the destruction of the man-child, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in so doing, far from destroying Christ, he was instrumental in Christ's sufferings and death on behalf of his people. God employed Satan as well as wicked men to bring about the redemption of his elect. So that's one reason. A second reason is Christ's redeeming work ensures the engathering of an elect multitude out of Satan's clutches. Acts 26 
and verse 18. Acts 26 and verse 18 where Paul is told that he is to go to the Gentiles to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Every conversion to Christ demonstrates Christ's power and ability to destroy Satan's usurped dominion. Every advance of grace in the heart of a believer, every upholding of Christ's kingship in the individual, the family, the church and the state is a demonstration of the power of Christ as he pleases to destroy Satan's tyranny. So that's the second reason. Christ's redeeming work ensures the ingathering of an elect multitude out of Satan's clutches and demonstrates the power of Christ as being infinitely superior to that of Satan. But then thirdly, Christ's resurrection signals redemption completed and also vindicates Christ's claims to be the one to whom all judgment has been committed. Christ's resurrection signals redemption completed and also vindicates his claims to be the one to whom all judgment has been committed. In John chapter 5 and verse 22, Christ says, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Verse 27, And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. God shows himself to be a just God and a Saviour in the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Godhead. And Christ declared, that all judgment was committed to him. When God raised him from the dead, he declared Christ's claims to be true. And that's why, as some of us were seeing at the open air yesterday, in Acts 17.31, we read where, that God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness, by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he raised him from the dead. When God raised Christ from the dead, he declared him to be the accomplished Redeemer, but he also declared him to be the Son of God with power, to whom all judgment belonged, as he had claimed. So that's the third reason why uh, Satan hates the kingdom of Christ and why Christ's uh, redeeming work is described as a triumphing over the devil. Fourthly, the present activity of the devil. The present activity of the devil. Satan by way of the serpent, introduced sin into the world in Genesis 3. He lied. He told Eve, ye shall be as gods, as if this was a good and beneficial thing. He encouraged pride by that lie that man would be independent of God. And uh, he was really seeking the destruction of man as God's creature reflecting God's glory. And so uh, Christ declares the devil to be the father of lies and a murderer from the beginning. He lied, he lied about God, he lied about what sin would bring and he was seeking the destruction of man as the head of God's creation. So he was a liar 
and a murderer. And he still seeks to promote all rebellion against God. He hates God and he hated the people of God in the Old Testament. That in Revelation chapter 12, those first four verses describe the dragon waiting for the, uh, the woman to give birth to the man-child. That's the Old Testament church. Uh, and he's watching for the uh, appearance in the Old Testament church of the one seed, the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so throughout the Old Testament, Satan was active seeking the destruction of the Old Testament church and of the promise of the Saviour with it. And so he was, uh, uh, he showed his enmity, he was, he stirred up Pharaoh, for example, seeking the destruction of Israel in Egypt, or Haman, seeking the obliteration of the Old Testament church and the promise of the church's saviour who was to appear within uh, the seed of Abraham. Then when Christ was born, he stirred up Herod, seeking the destruction of the man-child. And yet the man-child was preserved, accomplished redemption, and was taken up to heaven. We read that in Revelation 12 as well. So after the exaltation of Christ, then the dragon is wroth with the woman and with the remnant of her seed, that is, the continuing church of God in the New Testament age. So Revelation 12, verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Verse 17, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So Satan continues to hate the seed of the woman. He hates the Redeemer. He hates the redeemed. In the Old Testament, he afflicted the church of God and sought its extinction and the extinction of the promise of the Savior. He hated Christ himself at his birth, throughout his life, in his death, and yet Christ rose again from the dead as the exalted Redeemer, and now his rage is against the continuing people of God in this world. He hates the kingdom of grace, that is, the gospel of Christ, bringing sinners into hearty subjection to the Lord Jesus Christ. He hates it because he hates God and he hates his Christ. And he hates the idea of sinners submitting to God and to Christ by the power of God displayed in the gospel. He seeks the destruction of the church or else the discredit of the church. In Job chapter 1, as we said earlier, he seeks to besmirch the reality of the grace of God that Job uh, didn't love God unselfishly. He didn't really love God at all. He was just keeping in with God because of the perks that essentially is the argument. There is no new birth, there is no uh, real change, there's no devotion to God in Job. But there was, and God's power in Job preserved him and sustained him and demonstrated the reality of the kingdom of grace in Christ Jesus. The devil and his angels hate uh, the reminder of coming judgment and uh, Christ's power in the gospel and in saving sinful men is a constant reminder that that Christ who saves will come and will judge and so he trembles at the thought of God and of his Christ as they truly are and he knows that the torment is yet to come, that there is a place prepared for the devil and his angels. 
he seeks the ruin of God's people and he seeks to lead them as far as he can into sin and away from Christ. He intrudes uh, into the uh, thoughts of men and appeals to the sinful nature of man the indu and even the indwelling corruption of God's people, seeking to lure them away from Christ and lead them uh, into sin. In seeking to influence men at all, we believe that as an angel, that is a usurping of a role that does not belong to angels, and uh, it's part of the arrogance and wickedness of Satan. And so in First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9 we're told, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, mm -hmm. as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, mm -hmm. whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Fifthly, the limits of the devil's power. The limits of the devil's power. Here, consider, first, Satan is a mighty creature, but only a creature, and therefore is finite in knowledge and power, and he is never to be treated as in any sense equal with God. He is a finite creature, desperately wanting to usurp the place of the infinite God, the creator of all. Only God is infinite. Only God's attributes are infinite. Only God is from eternity. Satan had a beginning. He was a cre creature of God who rebelled against his maker. Satan is not infinite in any of his attributes. He is not limitless in his power or his knowledge or his presence. He is a creature of time with only limited, albeit great, power. Then the second thing to remember here is that God is always in control. God is always in control control. Job chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7. Job chapter 1 verse 6 and 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Verse 11, Satan is insinuating, but put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put, forth thine, put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now, However much we say, well, this is uh, putting it in a manner that we can understand this interaction between the Lord and Satan. The fact of the matter is that the Lord governs and restricts Satan's activity. That Satan can do nothing outside of the decree and the permission of God. Second Samuel chapter 24, Second Samuel 24 and verse 1. And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Now if you compare that with 1 Chronicles 21 and verse 1, 1 Chronicles 21 and verse 1, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number 
Israel. So there, God is uh, the ultimate, uh, it's his ultimate uh, purpose and that prevails, but instrumentally, without making God the author of evil, Satan is the one who uh, in, in, in instigates and leads David into this sin. First Kings chapter 22, First Kings 22 and verse 20. First Kings 22 and verse 20. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this man, and another said on that man. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. Now, however much, again, this is given in a manner that we can uh, understand, the fact remains that these, this passage must have meaning, and it must mean that even the activities of evil spirits are circumscribed by the decree of God. We've mentioned Judas, Satan entered into him, and yet it was the eternal purpose of God that Christ should be delivered up and be taken by wicked hands and crucified and slain. One final reference, 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7 to 9. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. So it was a messenger of Satan, but it was God who decided whether that messenger of Satan, that thorn in the flesh, who buffeted the apostle, would stay or go. And God decided it must stay, for however much Satan meant it for evil, God meant it for good to keep Paul humble, in the view of the abundance of revelation given to him. Sixthly, the certainty of the devil's eternal damnation. The certainty of the devil's damnation. We saw this in 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Jude verse 6 again, we saw that earlier. Jude verse 6, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains on the darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. Seventhly and finally, the folly of trivializing the devil and his angels. The folly of trivializing the devil and his angels. Christians should not be afraid of Satan in the sense of treating him according to his pretensions of equality and independence of God, or as if his ruin were, was not sure. Sometimes Christians attribute too much power to Satan, as if Satan knows everything. Satan doesn't know everything. Satan doesn't know the future except so far as God has revealed it. No creature can know the future. Only the God of heaven 
who has foreordained the future, who has foreordained whatsoever comes to pass. And Satan is as dependent as any creature upon revelation from God to know what the future holds. He has no independent knowledge of future things. He is a creature. Only the God who decrees the future can independently know the future and only that God can make known the future to any creature. We need to be clear on that point. So we should not be afraid of Satan in the sense of attributing to him what he would like to have attributed to him but which does not actually belong to him. The outcome of things is not in doubt. God will be seen to be God and all his enemies shall be damned including Satan and all his angels. But Christians should treat the devil as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. They should treat that seriously as a powerful enemy bitterly opposed to us and to all godliness. Halloween is a serious business among Satanists. Satanists do not treat Halloween as a joke. The, the witches' covens take it very seriously indeed. It is their high day. Its origin, as we've seen at other times, is among the Druids, the pagan Druids, and the idea that October 31st, that that night is when the veil between the living and the dead is at its uh, thinnest and the dead can return. And the occultists and the Satanists are very busy on Halloween night. Roman Catholicism did a makeover of this pagan festival, as they generally did, and made it into All Saints Day, which is what Halloween means. Hallowed, in other words, for saints, and uh, uh, Halloween is All Saints even. Uh, it's just. Uh, as it were, contracted into Halloween. And uh, Rome appointed All Saints Day on the 1st of November when prayers are said for the dead. And this is really no real improvement on the pagan version of Halloween. The bulk of people treat it as harmless fun. Satanists, occultists, they treat it as serious business. The rest treat it as a bit of fun. Satan keeps people under his thrall, either by knowing devotion or by their thinking that there is no devil. The bulk of the people around us are under the power of the devil and they don't even know. And the trivializing of the abomination of Halloween is behaving as if there were no devil and there were no demons and that we can safely treat the whole power of darkness as just a joke. Well, it isn't a joke. There is a devil. There are demons. There is principality. There are principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so Halloween either exposes to occultism or it is a trivializing of the truth about the powers of darkness 
which reinforces unbelief not only in the reality of the powers of darkness but of the living and true God, the God of light and holiness and the truth as it is in Jesus. It is unbelief of scripture, the word of God and what it says about the devil that causes people to think that they can trivialize the devil and demons and play about and make uh, and put on masks and so on as if there is no reality there are no real demons we just play about with it we should not treat, to treat the arch enemy of our God as trivial fun nor should we teach our children to do so we should treat Halloween as it really is an evil custom one that uh, is neither to be observed seriously nor to be observed in triviality but rather to be utterly shunned uh, because the word of God is to be believed in all that it teaches about God and about Satan, the great enemy of God. Ephesians 5 verse 11 And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them.